as I was looking at the Bismarck, I saw all these little winking lights, and I thought, oh, isn't that pretty? And all of a sudden, I realised that what I thought was pretty was death and destruction in the form of about eight tonnes of metal coming my way. The weather had deteriorated considerably, and we flew off um, into cloud, in snow, and appalling, really, flying conditions. At the end of May 1941, some of the world's most powerful warships jeweled in the middle of the Atlantic. It was to be one of the last great battles of the era of naval gunnery. It was a series of brutal encounters, all revolving around the flagship of the German Kriegsmarine, Bismarck. Bismarck is a, is a quantum leap for the Germans, and no, no question. Bismarck is as capable as anything that the British have got. Bismarck is a very impressive warship. She is extremely dangerous. Bismarck was now loose in the Atlantic. The Admiralty were now trying to find whatever ships they could and throw them at the problem. But the British have one job to sink Bismarck. If left unchecked, Bismarck threatened to dominate the Atlantic and starve Britain of the vital food and military supplies that flowed from the rest of the world. The Admiralty had no choice. Bismarck had to be stopped. On Valentine's Day 1939, at the Blum and Voss shipyard in Hamburg, the biggest ship ever built in Europe was launched. It was a triumphant day for Hitler. He had swept to power on the promise of overturning the Treaty of Versailles and returning Germany to a position of pride and power. And now he was christening one of the most powerful ships afloat a stark statement of intent. He concluded his speech. May the German soldiers and officers who will have the honor to command this ship one day prove themselves worthy of the name. The Bismarck. Bismarck is quite a large battleship for her era. She is about 250 metres in length, which is fairly impressive, and 30 metres in the beam, so she's wider than a lot of contemporary battleships. This helps to make her a very steady gun platform. She's able to make a very respectable speed of 29 knots at full speed, and that is quite fast. What's important about that is it's a speed that she can maintain in all weathers. Um, a lot of ships have a rated maximum speed, but it often drops in bad weather. Bismarck can push through and maintain her maximum speed when conditions are rough. Her armament is quite impressive. She has eight 15-inch guns mounted in twin turrets, two forward, two aft. Uh, lastly, there's Bismarck's armour and protection scheme. In keeping with traditional German warship building practice, they have emphasised what the more hyperbolic would call unsinkability. She has an incredible amount of internal subdivision, making her very hard to flood and therefore to sink. Her armor protection is comparable to most modern battleships of the era. And not only does she have very impressive protection on the side of the hull with a, a, a fairly dense armor belt, her turrets are very well protected and her command space has a very heavily armored conning tower. So between all of this, Bismarck is a very impressive warship. She's by no means the best battleship of her generation, but she is extremely dangerous. <laughs>
Bismarck is a, is a quantum leap for the Germans, and no, no question. Um, so prior to Bismarck coming into service, their most powerful ships are, are what they were nicknamed the Twins, the Scharnhorst and Neisenau. These are relatively small. The Germans call them battleships. The British always call them battle cruisers. Actually, what they are is a development of the Panzerschiffer. So they're, they're armed with 11-inch guns. They're quite fast. Um, but they're, they're not really a match on a one-on-one -on -one for any British battleship afloat at that point. Um, Bismarck is. Bismarck is as capable as anything that the British have got. Radar had designed the Bismarck as a commerce raider. As such, it was probably unstoppable. If Bismarck had broken out into the Atlantic, as other cruisers and, uh, and smaller ships had done throughout 1939 and 1940, the British would have a, a real problem. They had lacked the ships with the firepower to be able to take on Bismarck effectively on the high seas. But it would be two years before Bismarck was ready to threaten the seas. Two years, it would see Western Europe fall almost entirely under Nazi control. The UK had weathered the pounding from the Luftwaffe and avoided invasion by the Wehrmacht. But on the fringes of Europe, she was still desperately vulnerable. Britain now relied on fragile cargo routes that crisscrossed the oceans for her food and vital supplies that allowed her to continue resisting Nazi domination. Grand Admiral Rader, head of the German Navy, had witnessed the successes of the Army and Luftwaffe as they had dominated Central Europe, but also had seen how they'd struggled to subdue Britain. He was keen to remain useful in the eyes of the Führer and add naval victory to Germany's impressive list of achievements. It would now be the turn of the Kriegsmarine to try and break the British. So the, the German Navy in the Second World War, the most important thing to realise about it is it's terribly small. Um, nevertheless, they've used it operationally, um, most notably perhaps in, in Norway in 1940 when they use almost their entire fleet to transport an army and carry out a, a surprise attack on Norway. They have their pocket battleships, the famous Panzerschiffer. They, they go out on commerce raiding missions. They're in place at the beginning of the war. So by 1941, you've got a German Navy that has been probably, to be fair, doing the best it can given the results it has. The German Navy had been designed on different lines from the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy was all about sea power and sea control, controlling the sea lanes and imposing its will on the enemy. Essentially the same thing it had done in the Napoleonic Wars and during the First World War. The Germans were in the business of sea denial, limiting the, the enemy's fleet and pinning it in place but also then attacking his sea lanes. When we think about the commerce raiding of the Germans in the Second World War, we tend to focus on U-boats and submarines. Um, and clearly that's what does the most damage overall during the war. However, if you are able to put big capital ships to sea as well as submarines, that's the dream ticket in terms of commerce raiding. Because if you want to protect your merchant ships from submarines, what do you do? You group them into a convoy with lots of small warships that are anti-submarine ships around it. Job done. However, if a battleship like Bismarck rocks up, then the battleship can destroy all those small escorts and the convoy. So the only thing that a convoy can do if a battleship like Bismarck appears is scatter. And if it scatters, then all those individual merchant ships can be sunk by submarines. What was a game changer for it um, came in the spring of 1940 with the capture of French ports on the Atlantic, particularly Brest, which had a... Um, they had dry docks, they had port facilities, which could serve as both a U-boat fleet, but also if German battleships and heavy cruisers broke out into the Atlantic, they could use places like Brest as a base. Radar was quick to take advantage of the newly captured French ports on the Atlantic coast. He based his U-boat wolf packs there and sent them out deep into the Atlantic to prey upon British supply lines. The impact was immediate and devastating. The U-boat captains called this the happy time. 
Despite these successes, most still believe that only warships on the surface could deal a decisive blow in the campaign. And so as Bismarck underwent its final sea trials, Raider launched Operation Berlin in January 1941. Two fast, powerful battleships, Neisenau and Scharnhorst, swept through the Atlantic from Greenland to the Azores, smashing into Britain's vulnerable shipping lanes. The threat of Germany's surface fleet was now very real. Raider was thrilled with the success of Operation Berlin and desperate to try and repeat it, this time with his new super weapon, Bismarck. Unfortunately for him, there were no other big gunned battleships that were operational. But Bismarck would sail anyway, accompanied only by a squadron of smaller vessels and the heavy cruiser, Prince Eugen. The men in command of Bismarck were Vice Admiral Gunther Lutschens and his captain, Ernst Lindemann. Lutschens had been in charge of Operation Berlin and was now about to lead Germany's most potent naval asset out on another commerce raiding mission, Operation Rheinübung. And so on the 19th of May, 1941, the world's heaviest commissioned battleship slid out of a dockyard on the German-occupied Baltic coast escorted by her consort, Prince Eugen. On board the Prince Eugen was a small team from the propaganda company tasked with reporting on the mission. Amazingly, with them was a cameraman called Lagerman. Bismarck's maiden operation was filmed. Bismarck wanted to avoid contact with the Royal Navy as much as possible. The plan was to get out into the open Atlantic and start raiding not to engage other capital ships. But to get there completely unseen would prove impossible. Within hours of leaving port, a Swedish cruiser spotted the flotilla sailing west through the Baltic Sea. The Swedish reporter of it did not name the ship and contact was lost once it left Swedish waters. The message that made its way to the British Admiralty only read As Bismarck and Prince Eugen slipped out into the North Sea and up towards Norway, the British were already flying reconnaissance sorties over the Scandinavian coast. On the 21st of May, Flying Officer Michael Suckling flew over a fjord near Bergen and took a photograph that sent a chill to the core of the British Admiralty. The size of the ship in the photograph could only mean one thing. Admiral John Tovey put the Royal Navy on high alert. Bismarck was loose. So to understand the Royal Navy in 1941, we, we actually need to rewind quite a bit, actually. Um, actually, let's rewind to 1815 very, very briefly, because at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, the, the Royal Navy is the single most powerful dominant force in the world. Um, there's nothing else to touch it, and that's the case for the whole of the 19th century. So the Royal Navy goes into the First World War with a, a new young threat at sea, and also no operational experience fighting sea battles for the best part of 100 years, because there hasn't been anyone to take them on. Lots and lots of lessons are learnt for the Royal Navy during the First World War um, about command and control. Um, and the, the guys who were the, the junior officers commanding ships or first lieutenants of ships in the First World War, those are the people who are running the Navy in the Second World War. So they've got the men and they've also got the ships. Um, the, the Royal Navy at the start of the Second World War, it has its gaps but it's still the most powerful, the most potent navy in the world. So you've got um, a mix of older ships that are being refurbished, and that's actually a programme that is, um, is underway when the war breaks out. The battleships particularly were old. However, five new ones were building in 1941, and two of them, by May, had entered service with the home fleet, the King George V and the Prince of Wales. So that at least gave the British modern speedy battleships. That said, they've got considerable things facing them. Although the Royal Navy is huge, it is very, very stretched. They have gone into the Second World War confident that they could fight the Germans. That's fine. Um, they could fight the Germans and the Italians, 
with the French alongside them, that they lose the French in 1940. So suddenly they're up against the German Navy combined with the Italian Navy and they're doing it on their own. I'm deep beneath the streets of Liverpool now in Derby House. And this is one of the most important spaces of the British war effort because it was from here that the British directed operations in the Battle of the Atlantic. Here is where the information was gathered and plotted so that it could be instantly uh, accessible. You've got all the states and readiness of aircraft squadrons, of convoys, of naval assets, and then those assets would be plotted on this amazing map of the North Atlantic. You've got military vessels and submarines, enemy and allied. You've also got merchant marine convoys, ONS, that means outbound from Britain. HX means it's left Halifax heading for the UK. It gives commanders here a real-time view of what is going on in this battle space. It is essential to British success in the all-important Battle of the Atlantic. And as such, it was at the heart of that titanic month, May 1941, when the British attempted to catch the Bismarck. It was quite the undertaking. The British home fleet left their base in Scotland. These convoys were stripped of their military escorts. All non-essential missions were cancelled. It was the biggest single naval operation of the Second World War thus far. And at its heart was the pride of the fleet, the mighty hood. It was a massive ship, actually beautiful to look at. It was a wonderful looking ship. Yeah. She was long and uh, perfectly symmetrical, two turrets forward, two masts, two funnels, two turrets aft. Marvellous looking ship. I'd never seen anything quite so powerful and beautiful. For, well, beautiful for a battleship sounds an awful word, but it's, it, there's no other way to describe it. Hood was pretty much equivalent in size to Bismarck. She was about 860 feet in length, which was a very large vessel indeed. Somewhat slimmer than Bismarck, at only 100 foot in the beam. Uh, she was therefore perhaps best to describe her as an ocean greyhound. She was designed to be fast and she was designed to be very powerful. There's also a similarity in primary armament. She has eight 15-inch guns dispersed in very much the same way we see on the Bismarck. Two twin turrets forward, two twin turrets aft. Hood was quite respectably protected, but her protection scheme was dated. So although her armour was only marginally thinner than Bismarck's in terms of horizontal protection and was actually thicker in places around her turrets, Hood had been designed before the effects of long-range plunging fire had been fully understood. And because she had never had the comprehensive refit that had graced a couple of the Royal Navy's other capital ships, it meant that she went into battle with a scheme of protection that was inadequate to the demands of modern naval warfare. The final element, of course, was her speed. That long, thin hull was meant to purchase a very high speed. And in fact, the reason her upper deck is so low at the stern uh, it was basically to save weight, to squeeze as many knots as they could out of this design, which had already sacrificed a lot of weight in other directions. As completed, Hood could manage 31 to 32 knots fairly easily, a very high speed for a ship this size. But unfortunately, by 1941, her engines, although maintained, were aging. And unlike Bismarck, she wasn't designed in the same way to cope with very heavy weather. So while her printed speed, as complete, might have been 31 knots, her actual speed in 1941 was probably no better than Bismarck's. It may even have been a knot or so slower. By the start of the Second World War, Hood was probably the most famous warship in the world. During the interwar years, Hood spent most of her time showing the flag. She toured the world and was a floating embodiment of British sea power. She looked powerful, she looked sleek, she looked, above all, she looked elegant. She's the perfect vessel for showing the flag, brass bands playing, cocktail parties, and she'll impress anyone. The trouble was, during that time, she hadn't been overhauled. She could have been modified and improved and rearmored, but 
she was too useful as, a, as the poster child of British sea power. There is a, a mythical status to her that is hard to defend. Um, she is a battle cruiser. This is a, an evolutionary dead end for warships, really, that, that really should have been killed off after the Battle of Jutland when three of them blow up and sink. Their best defence is supposed to be their speed. So they, are, they look like a battleship. Um, they have the same guns as a battleship. They do not have the armour protection of a battleship, and as a consequence, they can go faster. And they're supposed to be used for scouring the oceans of commerce raiders. So you want a battle cruiser to go and find a pocket battleship and sink it. You do not want them standing up in the line against battleships. And they learn this at Jutland. Um, so they don't build any more. And actually, the Royal Navy only enters the Second World War with three of them, um, who had renown and repulse all of which date back to the, the closing years of the First World War. They are laid down and completed during the First World War. Renown and Repulse actually see service in the First World War and Hood comes in shortly afterwards. Um, so she is built really with problems. She gets this nickname, the Mighty Hood, and she is fundamentally the wrong ship to attach that label to. They really should not have done that. Despite those concerns, Hood, under the command of Vice Admiral Lancelot Holland, would be at the head of the strike force against Bismarck and should be accompanied by a brand new battleship, HMS Prince of Wales. The pair were ordered to cruise to the south of Iceland, where she could use her speed to intercept Bismarck whichever route she took to get into the Atlantic. Admiral Tovey knew that there were three options available to Lutchens, but still didn't know which he would take. He therefore ordered heavy cruisers to take up positions between Shetland and the Faroes, in the Icelandic Faroe Gap and in the Denmark Straits, the channel of water between Iceland and Greenland. The Royal Navy had set its trap. Whichever way into the rich hunting grounds of the Atlantic that Bismarck and Prince Eugen chose to take, the Navy would be waiting. Whether it was between the Faroes and Iceland or the Denmark Strait, between Iceland and Greenland, the German ships would have to pass through a British net. All these British ships had to do now was keep their eyes open and wait. On the 22nd of May, Bismarck and Prince Eugen were cruising off the coast of Norway and Lutchens needed to decide which passage they would take. He knew that the Royal Navy would be out there somewhere, but he didn't know where. At 1200 hours, he ordered a new course. Bismarck and Prince Eugen would try and break out into the Atlantic through the Denmark Straits. Stationed in the Straits were sister ships, HMS Norfolk and Suffolk. They'd been dispatched there on the 21st of May and their crews had been waiting patiently in foul North Atlantic weather. They would be the tripwire for the entire British plan. Sunday at 20 past seven, help me on to my right, the sheltered ship, and then two ships. I swam up the bottom of his wreck, and the steam up fast from behind us, coming up behind us, and the starboard water, his mouth beating. What had actually happened is that the, uh, the, the weather, which was closed right down, had suddenly lifted. And they were there on West Harbour Quarter, and I know that I know the distance because right behind me in the forward control there was a communication person who was repeating uh, messages from the radar office. And although we'd seen them first visually, I heard him say, Echo Berry, Green 140, 12,000, that was 12,000 yards. 12,000 yards is six nautical miles. Six nautical miles for a ship like this one to us was point blank. As the German ships are pushing through, they are spotted by the British cruiser HMS Suffolk on patrol in the Denmark Strait. Now, Suffolk and Norfolk, they're, they're not powerful enough to engage Bismarck, clearly, but what they can do is absolutely classic cruiser work, which is to find the enemy, report the enemy's presence, and then shadow them. And that's what they do. They, they pick up the Germans. The British have the advantage of radar. So they start to shadow the Germans through the Denmark Strait. The Germans try and throw them off. They know that the risks are there. Um, periodically, Bismarck turns and fires at them. It's, very, it's, it's a dance that the British are very used to. They pull out of range, they pull back in again, and keep methodically following them while heavier forces can be summoned up. Um, and the nearest force that can be brought up 
um, is HMS Hood, together with the brand new battleship HMS Prince of Wales. The British were planning to steal a march on the Germans, so they in fact uh, went to action stations very shortly after midnight on the morning of the 24th of May. The Germans were at a slightly lower alert level. They, they knew there were British cruisers tailing them, but those cruisers didn't represent an existential threat. They were more of a highly dangerous nuisance. Um, so the Germans were at the next alert level down. What that meant was that some of their crews were able to rest while about two thirds of the crew were closed up. And when they did sight Hood and Prince of Wales, it was a simple matter to go to full action stations and summon the remaining crew to their battle stations. So the state of play when these two forces meet is quite interesting because at the beginning, at the outset, you would think the British have the advantage, actually. Hood, we've discussed, is quite old, um, but she's still got those powerful 15-inch guns. Um, she's got her speed, um, and she's accompanied by Prince of Wales, which is another battleship, brand new, 14-inch gun, quadruple turrets, you know, a, a very powerful unit. Um, set against that, the Germans have Bismarck. Now, Bismarck is also unnew and untried. We tend to forget that. Bismarck and Prince of Wales are both on their first operational deployments. Prince of Wales has been rushed into hers, Bismarck's had a little bit more work up time, but neither of them have fought a battle. Um, and then the Germans have Prinz Eugen, also brand new, heavy cruiser. Realistically, she's pretty outmatched. Um, B uh, Prinz Eugen is not designed to go toe to toe with either Hood or Prince of Wales. The British also have two cruisers. So th there's a stronger British force there. <laughs> Prince of Wales, uh, Hood's consort in this operation, is a brand new battleship. She's one of the new King George V class battleships. These are very powerful warships, they're very well designed, they're reasonably fast, and her presence there should have been enough to ensure a British victory. But there was a lot going on under the surface. The first was Prince of Wales was extremely new. Her crew had only just been assigned, many of them were inexperienced. And the ship still had civilian contractors aboard because she'd been rushed into service so quickly and sent out to accompany uh, Hood. So what this meant in practice was you have a ship with a crew who are unfamiliar with her. Um, the ship has not undergone what they would call a shakedown cruise in order to knock her systems into order. Um, iron out all the kinks, identify potential mechanical problems and rectify them. None of that's really had a chance to happen. So although on paper Prince of Wales is an extremely powerful asset, she is not all that she seems and in many respects is actually less than she seems. When dawn came and the two sides spotted each other, Hood realised that the Germans weren't quite where he expected them to be. Shortly before, Luchens had altered course. Essentially, he's heading south. Now he's heading more in a southeasterly course. Holland had a decision to make. He could either continue to shadow the German ships and wait for Royal Navy reinforcements to arrive, or he could engage the enemy. At 5.37 a.m., he made his decision he would fight. The message was conveyed back to the Admiralty. Admiral Holland has no other choice other than to engage Bismarck. That's his job. So the, the German job is to avoid action and to, to get through into the Atlantic. That's Lutchen's job. Holland's job is to stop him. So Holland has to fight a battle. And actually he's got trained, experienced crews. I think we, we tend to think of the problems with Hood. The advantage of Hood is she's, she's a long-standing, you know, she's been in service for a long time. That's an experienced crew. You know, all, any faults, mechanical faults with Hood have been ironed out long before. You know, very coherent unit that knows what it's doing. And then Prince of Wales, a very powerful new force. So uh, there's nothing wrong with Holland's decision. He has to engage. The men on board the two British capital ships were now preparing for battle. We were all right on the Hood because, I mean, it was the best, it was the finest ship in the world. And 
we were safe. No bother. There was a certain amount of tension, yes. Uh, I wouldn't say we thought it was going to be historic, but we thought the hood was the best, and we would beat the enemy. But uh, as I said previously, there were going to be casualties. You don't go to any action like that without expecting casualties. But once again, it's going to happen to someone else. It's not going to happen to me. And over the loudspeaker system came a voice we didn't know particularly. And he said, this is the chaplain speaking. This was the prayer before Edge Hill. O oh Lord, thou knowest how busy we shall be today if we forget thee do not thou forget us Hood was in a lot of danger at the outset of the engagement it's very obvious from the start that the British are at a disadvantage they've approached out of position uh, the Germans are very fine off Hood's bow which means that they are crossing the British T their full broadside can be brought to bear on the British ships whereas the British have a a rather awkward choice to make. They can either turn to match the Germans, in which case you have an engagement where Hood is at a serious disadvantage in terms of her protection, or they can attempt to close the range. However, in closing, only the forward turrets on the Hood and on the Prince of Wales are able to bear. Holland takes this decision, God knows I wouldn't want to take it, to, to push close in as, as fast as possible before going into line. So he accepts the fact that he's going to be outgunned for a while, um, that the Germans will be able to bring all their guns to bear on just his forward guns as they close. So that's the decision he takes. The reason why Holland decides to close is to try and avoid the possibility of plunging fire as quickly as he can. Now, what is plunging fire? That is where you elevate your guns, a bit like a military howitzer, and you fire a shell that goes up in the air and then plunges down. And what that does is, if you hit the target, you're going to go through the deck armour rather than the armour belt around the side of the ship. Now, on any warship, the, the deck armour is more vulnerable than the armour belt. Um, on Hood, it's a particular problem because um, Hood is a battle cruiser. They have sacrificed armour protection for speed and Hood's deck armour is really, really not up to speed. Now, Holland knows this, um, so what he wants to do is get under, under the plunge as soon as he can blow to blow like boxers, pummeling each other on the belt armour. Fundamentally, he's got two very powerful ships and the Germans only have one very powerful ship. He's pretty confident he can win that. When the radar had first got this range, it was somewhere in the region of about nearly 20,000 yards, I should imagine. And watching this pointer, it was going 20,000, 19,000, 18,000, 17,000, 16,000. If it had been me, being a coward, I should have laid off uh, and ate of the range of the 15-inch guns and probably walloped him from there. And I thought, my goodness, in a minute we will be getting out our cutlasses and going aboard that German and giving him a good old taste of the Nelsons and the Drakes. Hood's huge guns open fire at 0553 hurling enormous projectiles, an astonishing 24 kilometres. But Hood's crew had made a terrible mistake. They were firing on the leading German ship, believing it to be Bismarck. But during the night, Bismarck and Prince Eugen had changed position. So for several crucial minutes, Hood was firing at the wrong target. In its own in isolation, it isn't that important. But the problem is all these little things are these levelling factors that then start to give the Germans an advantage. So you've got some time lost when they're targeting the wrong ship, essentially. Not only does that mean you're losing opportunities to hit Bismarck, but it's also giving Bismarck a free shoot because they're not being distracted by gunfire going off around them and shell splashes in the water. Um, when you add that to um, the, the need to close the range because of Hood's feeble deck armour, the mechanical problems on board Prince of Wales, all these factors then are starting to, to level things up for the Germans and take away what should have been a British advantage. 
crew on board the Prince of Wales made no such error, and despite her mechanical problems, it was the new battleship that scored the first hit. A shell smashed through Bismarck's bow without exploding, but severing fuel lines. Bismarck, like a prize fighter, absorbed the blows. Then Captain Ernst Lindemann barked a command to his gunnery officer, Schneider. Permission to fire. At 0555, Bismarck's guns roared. On board the Prince Eugen, the camera captured the huge flares from Bismarck's 15-inch guns, as well as the enormous shell splashes caused by British rounds falling all around the German ship. As I was looking at the Bismarck, I saw all these little winking lights and I thought, oh, isn't that pretty? And all of a sudden I realised that what I thought was pretty was death and destruction in the form of about eight tonnes of metal coming my way. Holland had ordered Prince of Wales and Hood to stay pretty close together to better coordinate their fire, but this presented Bismarck with an easier target. Using state-of-the-art Zeiss stereoscopic range-finding equipment, high in the superstructure of Bismarck, the artillery officer observed where his shells were landing and edged them ever closer to the British ship, correcting his fire. Bismarck was closing in. As Bismarck's shells roared overhead, Admiral Holland realised his terrible mistake. He calmly ordered, shift target to the right. His guns would now focus on Bismarck, but he lost valuable minutes. Holland is, is, is doing the best he can with the force that he's got available, and I think he's, he's demonstrating a knowledge of the strengths and weaknesses of the ships he's got, um, and trying to compensate for that in the best way he can. Um, and, you know, these, these smaller factors, they, they happen in battle, and I think it's very easy for us to sit there and, and say, well, the lookouts should have done their job better and distinguished between Prince Eugen and Bismarck, and, you know, you can argue about all these things, but actually he's got to do the job with the tools he has. There's always a, a, a strong element of luck, um, and some of these things just, just go against him. The cards don't turn in the right way. Another salvo from Bismarck came screaming in. This time, it was a hit. A shell landed in an ammunition store. Luckily, there was not a catastrophic detonation and fires were contained. Prince Eugen also scored a hit on Hood. German gunners smelt blood. At 6 a.m., Admiral Holland made the decision to turn his ship to bring all of his guns to bear. At the same time, Bismarck, at a distance of about nine miles, unleashed another savage salvo. Her monstrous shells dropped all around Hood until one of them scored another direct hit. No one knows where the fatal blow landed. There's no way that we can know. But there are two theories that were advanced at the time and have many supporters today. One is that the shell simply plunged through the decks, which would not be unexpected in terms of what was understood at the time, a plunging fire hit that penetrates through this protection that is not adequate to guard against it, scores a lucky hit in a magazine and starts off a chain reaction which dooms the ship. The other possibility is that it might have been what's called a short, where the shell does not actually hit the ship at first, but lands in the water very close by. And what happens in the case of a, a, a hit like that is that the shell has entered the water, um, but by sheer good or bad fortune, depending on whether you're the recipient, um, actually travels beneath the level of the side armor and penetrates the hull below it. That too could have caused the chain reaction that destroyed Hood because of course, the bottom of the ship is where the magazines are, and if a heavy shell like that gets through and causes a fire, then you have problems. It's interesting to note that one of the Hood survivors stated that as Hood was making her turn and was able to finally unmask her rear gun batteries, uh, X turret, the third one from the bow, fired, 
Y turret remained strangely silent. So it's entirely possible that whatever was going wrong had begun to go wrong at that point. Uh, regardless, within the next few minutes, uh, everyone saw the explosion which destroyed Hood. Witnesses to that fateful moment say that a flame like a, a blowtorch flared up into the sky, followed by an almighty explosion. Hood disintegrated. I personally didn't hear any explosion at all. Again, the ship shuddered and we were all thrown off our feet. And all I saw was a gigantic sheet of flame which shot round the front of the compass platform. After, after the hit, you, you heard the screams and the uh, noise of, uh, uh, of the carnage that was going on. There was no order given to abandon ship. It wasn't necessary. On the horizon of the Prince Eugen film, distant smoke from the stricken hood can be seen. Witnesses likened the devastation to what happened to HMS Barham just six months after Hood. It too saw its magazines explode, ripping the ship apart. And in the corner of my binoculars where I could see, we were so close, I could see the Hood. All of a sudden there was a huge, great orange flash. And then when I looked out from my binoculars to where the Hood was, there was no Hood. Hood was ripped in half. The stern section sank within seconds. The bows rose vertically up into the air. The guns fired one last eerie salvo, a final act of defiance from a doomed gun crew. Within three minutes, the mighty Hood, the pride of the Royal Navy, the most famous ship in the world, sank beneath the waves. Of 1,418 men on board, only three survived. We received information that the hood had been, had been sunk. That sounded impossible. And we waited for confirmation. And we were very anxious that we should serve the guns quickly because if the hood had been sunk, then we had a, would have a double job. As the crew of the Prince of Wales watched in horror as their comrades were sucked beneath the waves, the reality of their own position now suddenly dawned on them. They were one British ship facing two Germans. In the next four minutes, seven shells smashed into Prince of Wales. The situation was getting desperate. We'd had a 15-inch shell go through the bridge and explode as it was going out and killed an awful lot up there. And a boy of 16 thinks that being wounded is a nick in the shoulder. But I, in my keenness, I was very, very keen in those days. Went to do what I was supposed to do and start tidying up the bridge. And I went in and um, expecting to see people. And um, the first thing I saw as I went in, the wood panelling was just little bits of flesh spattered all around. And that was a very, very big shock to me. I don't think I ever got over that. Less than 10 minutes after Hood had slipped beneath the waves, Captain John Leach of the Prince of Wales decided that the odds were stacked too heavily against him. He ordered a hard turn to port and for his ship to make an escape. to our dismay at about ten past six the captain came on and said I remember his words hood's blown up, broken in two and sunk now the hood was a legend of the Navy as most people know and we were told that the Prince of Wales had had to withdraw to, re to repair its damage and we're in that Suffolk and Norfolk on the road this mark of Prince Oigan so he didn't look a very, very happy situation The British had been terrified about what Bismarck might have been capable of if it was unleashed on the Allied supply routes across the Atlantic. Now, in the space of just a couple of minutes, firing just a few salvos, 
Bismarck hadn't sunk some unarmed merchant ship, but the pride of the Royal Navy. Britain's worst fears had been realised. HMS Norfolk, that had been shadowing the battle, sent a simple communique back to the Admiralty in London. They released a terse note that same evening. During the action, HMS Hood received an unlucky hit in a magazine and blew up. There was nothing really in the British psyche that could replace a loss uh, so, so dramatic of such a prestigious warship. It was essentially a huge slap in the face to British pride and uh, British sense of naval superiority. Uh, the world had almost turned upside down. What on earth could the, could the Bismarck do next? The Royal Navy itself is not going to be super surprised by this. One of the things that has allowed the Royal Navy to be so dominant for so many centuries is, is culturally they have always seen ships that are assets to be used, and when you use assets, you might lose them. This isn't the first ship the Royal Navy have lost in action. Politically, um, and in terms of domestic morale, it's devastating. The, the Hood has gone, and the Hood hasn't just gone, she's gone in seconds and taken almost her entire ship's company, other than three men, down with her. So that is a, a really significant problem. And you have to look at the wider context without trying to, to divert us too much. This is not a point where the war is going well for the British anyway. So from Churchill downwards, this has to be avenged. It has to be very publicly avenged. In Germany, the news that Hood had been sunk was met by widespread jubilation. Goebbels made the most of it. It was a huge propaganda coup. Bismarck uh, had bested the most famous warship in the world and the pride of the British fleet. So there was no stopping uh, Germany, which could now break out in the Atlantic and destroy Allied convoy routes. That was the message coming out of Germany. Uh, Hitler was delighted. His, his support of radar had been vindicated. And for the moment, everything looked rosy. When word of Bismarck's success was radioed back to Germany, Hitler's propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, immediately broadcast it to the nation. Germany now had a huge maritime victory to cheer, alongside its remarkable run of conquests on the European continent. The Schlachtschiff Bismarck has hereby an English Schlachtkreuzer, wahrscheinlich Hood, vernichtet. The British were devastated, but that disappointment didn't breed despondency. Instead, the Admiralty were gripped by an iron determination. Every ship, every asset was now redirected to one very simple end, to sink the Bismarck. And then we were hit. There was a terrific explosion, and the whole ship suddenly dead silence. The sight setter suddenly shouted, The hood's gone. Someone said, What? And he said, The hood's gone. And it was just unbelievable that the hood was there one minute and she was no longer there. And we were dumbstruck with the thought that the hood had been sunk by the Bismarck. In May 1941, Germany's newest and most powerful battleship, Bismarck, was dispatched on her first mission, Operation Rheinubung. She would be adding her massive firepower to the German effort to starve Britain into submission. 
Just five days into her maiden voyage, Bismarck was already having a huge impact on the war in the Atlantic. She had smashed through the British blockade and in an engagement lasting under 10 minutes, she had sunk the Royal Navy's totemic flagship, HMS Hood. Bismarck was now in the Northern Atlantic and had British convoys in her sights. Winston Churchill and many in the Admiralty were plunged into a state of depression, but the path ahead of them now lay clear. Hood's loss could not be in vain. The reputation of the Royal Navy had to be salvaged at all costs. Bismarck had to be found and destroyed. Whilst the British reeled from the loss of the hood, the crew on Bismarck knew that there was another side to the story. She might have been the most powerful battleship afloat, but Bismarck had not escaped the Battle of the Denmark Strait unscathed. She had suffered, according to German records, a total of three hits. Now, two of these hits are generally agreed to have been of no real consequence, cosmetic damage, but nothing worse than that. But the third hit was the one which caused serious problems. It struck somewhere in the region of the bow and it tore a hole in Bismarck's armor. Now, the hole in itself was not enormous, but because Bismarck was moving at speed, it exacerbated the flooding and hundreds of tons of seawater entered the ship before they were able to try and stabilize the situation. This caused Bismarck's bow to sink into the water a little and it reduced her speed by a knot or two. May not sound significant, but when you're being pursued, those extra knots can be critical. The much more serious consequence of the hit was that it severed the connection between Bismarck's forward fuel tanks and her machinery spaces. This is causing two problems. It's causing, um, it's causing problems with the ship losing way. She's lost a bit of speed, but she's also hemorrhaging fuel oil. Um, and that itself causes two problems. The first is the obvious one. She hasn't got enough fuel, so that limits how far she can go. But secondly, she's leaving an oil trail in the water. So you can almost, it's almost like breadcrumbs. It makes her very easy to follow and spot, um, particularly from the air. So this is a really significant problem. And as the Germans are pulling away, they're, they're trying to, trying to, do everything they can to, to get at this and patch this. They even try and send divers down over the side while the ship's underway. It's really, really hard to do. They, they fail. So this is a problem that they, they never really resolve. So in the same way that we see during the action with Hood, those little incremental problems that started to shift the balance in favour of the Germans, the Germans are now starting a process of little incremental issues that are shifting the odds against them. Admiral Luchens is faced with some options. He can continue the raid, but he has less time to do it than he normally would. Another option is to return back through the Denmark Strait and head off to Norway, hook up with a tanker and try again once the ship's been patched up a little. The other option is to head out into the Atlantic and loop round to Brest. The advantage there is Scharnhorst and Neisnau were there. Neisnau is damaged, Scharnhorst is in refit, but the idea that all three ships together would then be in the one port where they could then break out en masse was, was a fairly appealing one to Luchens. Bismarck continues through the Denmark Strait and out into the Atlantic. There is again some controversy about whether, whether um, Prince of Wales, which is mechanically unreliable and with an inexperienced ship's company, and then the two cruisers should have gone back in and engaged Bismarck and Prince Eugen. Who knows what the outcome of that would have been. Either way, what actually happens is um, they opt to shadow again. The Germans know they need to shake off this shadowing force as soon as possible. Whatever their options are, it's going to be a lot better for them if nobody knows where they are. Lindemann wanted to carry out running repairs and then steer Bismarck straight towards those vital Allied shipping routes across the Atlantic, the original objective of Operation Rhein-Uben. Lutchens disagreed. Bismarck would return to a safe harbour as quickly as possible. Churchill knew the danger that Bismarck now posed, so he gambled. He ordered 
every available ship in the Royal Navy into the Atlantic to join the hunt. The Admiralty were now trying to find whatever ships they could and throw them at the problem. Essentially, that meant one battleship, Tovey's flagship, King George V, a sister ship of the Prince of Wales, with largely the same gunnery problems facing her, although not quite so acute, and also the aircraft carrier Victorious. Other ships were around. Uh, the battleship Rodney, for instance, was escorting the troop ship Britannic, uh, and she was in the Clyde. So the Admiralty made the decision to peel her away from that convoy, along with most of the escorting destroyers uh, under Captain Vian, and add them to Tovey's force. One remaining force was down in Gibraltar, Vice Admiral Somerville's Force H, uh, based at Gibraltar, which could, if needed, sail north to intervene. Given the circumstances and, and the, the, the scale of the catastrophe they have experienced with the loss of Hood, this is the appropriate response. That there is a bigger picture here and that bigger picture is the political picture. And that, to be fair, is what Winston Churchill has to think of. He's, he's got half an eye and how is this playing out in the US? Every time the British get a knockback in battle, it weakens the American perception about, is, is Britain a country? Is, is Britain a viable investment? Is Britain going to be able to stay in this war? Um, you know, if, if the Royal Navy loses a capital ship at sea, that has, has consequences that go way beyond the tactical. Tactically, she's an old ship and the British have quite a few more. But politically, it's, it's a real problem. So it is an appropriate response. Despite Bismarck's decision to return to port, her cruiser escort, Prince Eugen, was still fully operational, able to continue with Operation Rheinubung. At 1812, Bismarck looped back to face the pursuing ships and opened fire, a handy diversion for the Prince Eugen. She peeled off and headed south. Bismarck turned back onto her course and carried on alone. Despite its condition, Bismarck was still capable of steaming at 28 knots. That's the same speed that the brand new flagship of the home fleet, King George V, was able to do. There was simply no way Bismarck could be caught unless something changed. The Royal Navy would have to find a way to slow it down. The British simply didn't have any vessels large enough to bring Bismarck to action within range. So at 1600 hours, Admiral Tovey ordered his aircraft carrier, HMS Victorious, to prepare her squadron of torpedo bombers for an immediate strike. The whole idea of air power at sea was a fairly newfangled invention. Uh, the British had, uh, had achieved great success in 1940 with their attack on the Italian fleet at Taranto, but this was a different, different thing entirely. This was a modern battleship with very good integrated anti-aircraft defences um, and being attacked at sea by essentially raw pilots and raw, raw air crew. So that was a very desperate roll of the dice. What carrier aviation gives you is the ability to punch beyond the horizon. It basically, it, you need to think of a carrier aircraft as, as a shell that you can actually file for hundreds of miles. It's a huge force multiplier. So um, the trick is to get this airstrike in and try and slow Bismarck. I mean, you'd like to sink her if you can. It's unlikely, but you're gonna give it a go. The main strike aircraft is the Swordfish torpedo bomber. Now, people look at the Swordfish and they call it obsolete because it's a biplane and it has an open cockpit. I don't know, honestly, how many successes the Swordfish has to score before we stop calling it obsolete. The Swordfish is an extremely good naval strike aircraft. And what we need to understand is, is that actually the requirements for, for naval aircraft are completely different to the requirements for anything that you're operating on land. You're not that worried about speed, actually, because you're not going to outrun anything. You're not going to find fighter opposition in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, what you want is something that can carry a lot of weaponry. It's very stable, fly in a straight line, that's what you need in a, in a good torpedo bomber, and can absorb a lot of punishment. And actually the swordfish can absorb a phenomenal amount of punishment. Cannon shells just go straight through the fabric wings. They just make a hole and they go out the other end and they don't explode. There's a really difficult thing about torpedo bombing, and again, I can't emphasise enough, 
doesn't matter whether you're in a swordfish or in any other torpedo bomber, you have to do what is completely alien to a, a pilot attacking anything, is fly in a straight line. That's how you deliver torpedoes. So your path is incredibly predictable to an anti-aircraft gunner. So it, it's, a, it's a really, really tough challenge. The first attack, which was delivered by swordfish torpedo bombers from Victorious, attacked in fading light and in rather poor conditions. So they, they were not off to a terribly good start. They only secured one hit and that struck the Bismarck roughly amidships towards the centre. This was very unlucky for the British because that was the centre of Bismarck's armour belt and also where her torpedo protection was most effective. Like any other battleship, Bismarck would have had her standard hull plating. She would have then had a layer of armour bolted onto that and for most of the length of, sh of the ship, there would have been an additional layer of hull plating with empty void spaces. In the event of a torpedo strike, the blast would be absorbed by the outer plating and any flooding would simply fill the void space without damaging the hull beyond it. That was the theory. It took an awful lot of design work to get it right, but Bismarck's designers had done their job very well there. The attack was hardly the decisive blow that the Navy needed. Nevertheless, the British shadow force was still glued to Bismarck, following that oil slick trail. For Bismarck though, that trail was only one of her problems. Calculations by the crew, based on her remaining fuel supply, estimated that the most economical speed for her to make it to a safe port was now only 20 knots. It looked like the tables were starting to turn a little more against the German ship. Lutchens knew that he no longer had the speed to make a clean break from his pursuers, but he did have one key advantage, and that was the British didn't actually know where he was heading. If Lutchens couldn't outrun them, he'd have to outsmart them. Bismarck was steaming across the Atlantic, the tiniest needle in the most massive haystack and one that could go in any direction at a moment's notice. It was imperative for Norfolk, Suffolk and the Prince of Wales to remain in contact with Bismarck. Without them relaying information back to the rest of the fleet, the hunt would become almost impossible. The interesting thing about the Second World War at this point is both sides are fighting with and against technology that hasn't been used in action before. So the British are using radar, which is a great advantage, but it's pretty crude radar at this point in the war. It's fairly short ranged. It's pretty difficult to operate. Um, you know, the, the classic kind of rotating radar, they don't have that. You, you kind of maneuver the ship in order to, to change the direction of the radar. Um, equally, the Germans haven't fought against radar before either. So they're kind of making up tactics on the hoof to try and deal with radar equipped opposition. There was a message, as I understand it, from the Admiralty to say that we were entering a very concentrated area of U-boats. And so we were given a course, a zigzag course, to pursue in case it was a U-boat round. I think this was the undoing of the whole thing because, as I understand it from the radar people, we had an echo on one leg. On the other leg, we didn't have an echo. So it was a full echo. At 3am on the 25th, Lutchens took advantage of this break in the radar coverage and ordered Bismarck to go full speed, 28 knots, and told his helmsman to steer west before turning north. On board Suffolk, the radar operator waited for Bismarck to reappear, but no signal came in. Bismarck had managed to turn around behind her pursuers. It was the dead of night, there was no radar signal, the British had lost Bismarck. This whole manoeuvre by Lutchens was probably one of the um, most spectacular pieces of timing he could have dreamt up. Only by watching what the British were doing and timing things to perfection and knowing the limits and speed of his, of his ship and the British likely course meant that he had this little window to achieve this. All he did was loop out and sail round, curve round to the north and went in behind uh, the British cruisers away from the, the pursuing home fleet and then he was clear to head towards Brest with nothing between him and the French port. <laughs> 
Losing Bismarck on radar, losing radar contact is dev a devastating blow for the British. So previously, if you imagine, you've got, you've got a speck in the middle of the ocean, but you know where that speck is, and the British are vectoring everything they've got to get the aircraft carriers within range, bring the battleships in to engage. Suddenly, they've lost that advantage. They do not know where Bismarck is, and you're sitting there with a chart, and you know Bismarck's speed, and you're just thinking there's a huge circle, and the ship could go in any direction within that circle. So this is a catastrophe and it has to be dealt with as soon as possible because the more time that elapses since you last had contact, the greater the variety of places she could end up. Fearing that alone they would be easy prey should they run into Bismarck in the dead of night, the three British ships decided to hunt for Bismarck together. With no better option other than to guess, they altered their course west and began steaming until daybreak. When no contact was made, Rear Admiral Wake Walker on board HMS Norfolk ordered the three ships to break off and do a daylight search for Bismarck. They all went in the wrong direction. At the time we lost contact was about three o'clock in the morning. I don't think we got to know uh, no, no about it until about five or six o'clock because then we were going in all different directions. Suffolk was sent west, Norfolk went south, Prince of Wales went east, I think. And um, to, 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 to try and find the young Bismarck again. The tension on Bismarck must have been unbearable at this point because um, they've lost radar contact, this is a good thing, but they know that it's only a window. They know that, that the most powerful navy in the world is, has almost all its assets deployed to find them. Um, they know they're leaking oil. Um, they know that the importance of finding and sinking them, th 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 this will be to the British. So they've got this window to try and get home um, and every effort they made must have been dedicated to doing that, to pushing the ship through. They knew they weren't out of trouble yet, even though they had been lost by the British. The British search became more frantic. It was compounded by the rapidly decreasing fuel levels on board all searching ships, which had been steaming at full speed to try and intercept the German. On board Bismarck, Lutchens could never have guessed that his manoeuvre would be so successful. And so, in a moment of misjudgment, a long message was transmitted from Bismarck back to German naval headquarters. A potential lifeline had just been thrown. That message was intercepted by the British, which allowed them to estimate Bismarck's position. Those coordinates were then immediately sent to Tovey's flagship, King George V, where there was a moment of spectacular incompetence. The position was plotted wrongly on King George V's charts. Tovey set a course to intercept and spent the next seven hours steaming in completely the wrong direction. As night began to fall, Bismarck's position had been unknown for almost 24 hours and the Royal Navy were no closer to locating her. In the darkness of the night, the chance of her being found was zero. Bismarck could steam on towards a safe harbour, almost certainly unopposed. She could be anywhere within thousands of square miles of ocean. As Churchill went to bed on the night of the 25th, he announced, these three days have been the worst yet. As Churchill and the Navy High Command waited on the brink of despair, information came in from Bletchley Park that offered a glimmer of hope. It was a decrypted order from the Luftwaffe, telling its units to redeploy in order to protect Bismarck as it neared the French port of Brest. Now, the Navy had an inkling of where Bismarck was heading and they scrambled to put together a plan to stop her. As the hours ticked on, the chances of finding and catching Bismarck were increasingly unlikely. Searches had been constant. Long-range flying boats scoured thousands of square miles of empty ocean looking for Bismarck. But now, with the information that Bismarck was heading for Brest, they could finally concentrate their search. Then, after over 30 hours of searching, at 10.30 on the 26th of May, Ensign Leonard B. Smith, an American on a Catalina flying boat out of Northern Ireland, spotted a rainbow oil slick on the sea. And then, 
Bismarck. Smith immediately called in the position. The German was making a decent speed and was just 800 miles from Brest. It was electrifying news. Bismarck had been found, but the Navy would have to act fast. They calculated Bismarck's speed and bearing and realized that within less than a day, Bismarck would be safely back under the protective air umbrella of Luftwaffe aircraft from Brest. That meant that most of the Royal Navy ships in the Atlantic had no chance of catching her. But the Navy did have one card left to play, Force H. So Force H is, a, is an interesting beast, and it's a really classic example of, of how you have to improvise in wartime. Um, so if you just track back to, to 1940, British strategy in the Mediterranean is based around operating with the French. The French are going to cover the Western Mediterranean, the British are going to cover the East, and that's job done. France drops out of the war in the summer of 1940, and the Western Mediterranean is uncovered. So what would have been a French responsibility, the British have to pull together some ships from elsewhere and create a force based on Gibraltar that can operate in the Western Mediterranean and also out into the Atlantic, which is what the French would have done. Vice Admiral Somerville's Force H was centred around his flagship, the small battle cruiser Renown. She was accompanied by the aircraft carrier Ark Royal and a cruiser, a light cruiser, the Sheffield. So they were now powering north through the Bay of Biscay and on to try to intercept Bismarck. Force H needed to get their aircraft carrier, Ark Royal, into a position to launch her torpedo bombers to repeat the attack of a few days before. This time, the Navy was in even more desperate need of success. However, as they drew in to only 70 miles from Bismarck, the Atlantic swell started to grow and the weather closed in. It was now or never. The swordfish had to be launched or Bismarck would surely never be caught. The swordfish were fitted with new magnetic torpedoes. Then in the early afternoon, with the deck pitching through 55 foot waves and the teeth of a violent gale, 14 swordfish aircraft lumbered into the sky. They were carrying not only their bombs, but the hopes and expectations of the entire nation. And we climbed up to about 8,000, 9,000 feet and although it was blowing hard and there was a big sea running, the weather then was, the visibility was good. And there was a lot of broken cloud. And we could see the target as we were being led in through gaps in the cloud. And down we went in our dive and turned in to the attack. Now I had my doubts as we went down because I could see the ship and she wasn't firing at us. And I thought, well, that, that's odd, you know. Previous attacks that I had done, the ship was firing at us in the dive. And as I leveled out on the water, I saw other aircraft dropping their torpedoes. And I looked at the ship and I said, that is a town-class cruiser. I don't know which one, but it is a town-class cruiser. And it had its battle white ensigns up. And so I didn't drop my torpedo. My leader did, he dropped his, and I held on to mine. The majority had just dropped their torpedoes on HMS Sheffield, the cruiser from Force H that had steamed up with Ark Royal from Gibraltar. It was another colossal error by the Royal Navy. Well, now, when we got back to the ship, they told us that it was Sheffield. But in the briefing, you see, they never told us that Sheffield had been detached. We didn't know she was there. The signal to detach the Sheffield to shadow the Bismarck was not repeated to Art Royal. Fortunately for the Sheffield, the torpedoes either missed or malfunctioned. But it was another horrible mistake. More precious hours wasted in that race to catch Bismarck. So the, the clock is ticking now and, and you know, the, the, the odds are, are starting to stack against the British. Um, the, the failed attack on, on Sheffield is a disaster really because it just costs time. So what, the, what they have to do now is, is get those strike aircraft back onto Art Royal, get them down below decks, get new torpedoes on them, get back up again and redeploy the strike force. That all takes a long time to do. 
you can imagine how frenetic it would have been down in, in Art Royal's hangar as each aircraft drops down, getting those, those new weapons on, on very quickly. You've got tired aircrew who have already done one, one mission. But nevertheless, they take the decision, they're going to try for one last strike before it gets dark. And really, if it gets dark and they haven't done something significant to slow Bismarck down, the, the chances of her getting home safely are, are getting greater and greater if she gets another night steaming. At 1910, the rearmed swordfish were launched off a lurching Ark Royal. The battleships that had the best chance of battering Bismarck, Rodney and King George V, were still a distance away and starting to run low on fuel. Rodney could only keep up its pursuit for another 12 hours. King George V radioed Rodney. Through filthy weather, the swordfish bore down on their target. It was now or never. In a sign of things to come for naval warfare, one of the most important strikes in the history of the Royal Navy was now being delivered by aircraft. When the attack actually came, it was in little penny packets of aircraft dropping down through the clouds, finding this German battleship in front of them, and then carrying out their attacks. We turned in and made our attack down to 90 feet, dropped the fish, turned hard downwind, and jinked all over the sky. And of course, the ship itself, you could see all the guns firing at you in a tracer in green, red, orange, white, all coming towards you. Suddenly there were great eruptions of spray going up in the air and, and we realised that she was firing her main armament at us in the hope that, you know, they'd drop a shell kind of somewhere near and we'd be swamped by the, by the spray. The attack by the bombers from Ark Royal succeeded much more than the previous attacks had done. Um, again, due to luck, but this time luck had shifted in the British direction and away from the Germans. When the bombers first approached, the conditions were very similar to the ones that had stimmied Victorious's planes. Um, the weather was rough, Bismarck was free to manoeuvre, so even though she was a large target, she was making it difficult for them. And that very impressive anti-aircraft battery of hers was putting up an awful lot of flak. What is remarkable under the conditions is that two torpedoes struck their mark. One, like the previous attack, struck the ship where her anti-torpedo protection was strongest and did no appreciable damage. But the second one was far more, far more effective and far more dangerous for Bismarck. That torpedo hit struck right aft in the vicinity of her propeller and rudders. Now, fortunately for the Germans, the propellers were not damaged by the blast. That could have been even more fatal. But what did happen was that the torpedo struck just as Bismarck was making an evasive turn to port, and it meant that her rudders were now jammed 15 degrees to port. If that damage could not be made good, Bismarck, who was so close to escaping from the pursuing British, was now stuck, uh, only able to steam in circles. Even in the immediate aftermath of the attack, the identity of the man who dropped the crucial torpedo was unclear. Until recently, it was accepted that Jock Moffat made the decisive strike. But recent research has suggested that in fact, the man who disabled Bismarck was Kenneth Patterson. And as we turned away, my observer, he looked over the side of the aircraft astern and saw our torpedo actually running. You could see the wake of it in the, in the sea. And I knew that I'd aimed off for her speed and as I was in the better position to do the attack, I, I'm quite sure it was my torpedo. It was a one in a million shot. Bismarck was now helpless, steering in a sweeping circle. They tried to repair the ship, but it was hopeless. Lutchens knew the game was up. The British fleet would be on his position within hours. At 21.40, he radioed his headquarters with Bismarck's position, and a statement of defiance. That night, 
the crew of Bismarck were allowed to raid the stock cupboards, gorging themselves on ham, tinned pineapple and rum. An announcement was made over the PA. The German people are with you, and we will fight until our gun barrels glow red hot and the last shell has left the barrels. For us seamen, the question is now victory or death. The minute that torpedo disables the steering gear, the heart must have been ripped out of Bismarck's ship's company. Bis the, the Germans cannot win at this point. So where the odds were starting to go in their favour a little bit, if they just managed to evade that one last torpedo strike, they may have had a really good chance of getting home, getting under that Luftwaffe fighter umbrella and getting into Brest. That chance is now gone. They really can, to paraphrase Raider at the beginning of the war, their only option now is, is to die bravely. They're not going to win this action. They're steaming in a circle. They're leaving a telltale trail of oil. They can't, if you imagine it, they're not only an easy, predictable target, but they also can't fire their own guns properly because they're steaming in a circle. And the entire Royal Navy is looking for them. And they have to spend this long night waiting for this to happen. So absolutely unbearable tension on board. But it wouldn't be a quiet night of rest and preparation for the Germans. British destroyers swarmed around Bismarck, harassing the Leviathan as the British fleet closed in. By dawn on the 27th, King George V and Rodney were finally in range. Once again, the British had big guns trained on Bismarck. She was now within range of Admiral Tovey in King George V and the even more powerful battleship Rodney. Away to the north was the Ark Royal with her aircraft standing by to launch another strike. And then to the, to the south and the northeast were two British heavy cruisers, Dorsetshire to, coming up from the south and Norfolk, who had been shadowing her from the first, was approaching from, from the northeast. So Bismarck was finally being hemmed in by these British forces. The British battleships that are closing in to finish off Bismarck in her final hours are a rather odd mismatched pair. On, on the one hand, you have King George V, who is a very modern battleship, completed roughly around the same time, slightly earlier than Bismarck, um, and in many respects a comparable ship. She has different guns, slightly smaller, 14 inches, but she has 10 of them. Her armour protection is every bit as comprehensive as Bismarck's, and in some respects, her armour protection to vital areas is, is marginally better. Um, like Bismarck, she also has very comprehensive anti-flooding um, arrangements, although some would argue not as comprehensive as Bismarck, but it's quibbling over small change. The only area where she's slightly behind Bismarck is in speed. As designed, she's one or two knots slower. So it's not unfair to say that King George V and Bismarck are very closely matched in ideal circumstances. Rodney is a rather curious beast. Completed in 1927, she is a much older ship, but she is also an extremely powerful one. Uh, Rodney and her sister Nelson were the first ships in the Royal Navy to mount 16-inch guns, and she has nine of these weapons. So her broadside is much heavier than Bismarck's. In terms of armour protection, she's a very different animal. She follows a very different protection scheme, uh, whereby the most vital areas have extremely thick armour, and the less vital areas have hardly any. The only area where Rodney falls behind Bismarck is in speed, as designed, she can only make 23 knots. So had Bismarck been free to maneuver, she could have simply run away from Rodney if she didn't fancy her chances. Her exhausted crew had been at action stations and therefore without sleep for nearly 24 hours. They'd been constantly attacked. They'd been harassed during the night by destroyers. Um, they were tired, they were demoralized. And now here were two fresh British battleships who had yet to see action. Uh, with crews who were ready, who were well-trained, familiar with their ships. In ideal circumstances, either British ship would have had a 50-50 chance of defeating Bismarck, I believe. Uh, in the circumstances of the 27th of May 1941, both British battleships made Bismarck's defeat a certainty. At 0847, 
HMS Rodney opened up with her massive 16-inch guns, followed shortly after by King George V. Bismarck had been hunted down. Now, she needed to be sunk. At 08.50, Bismarck's guns roared in reply, but buffeted by heavy seas, unable to steer properly, Bismarck found it impossible to fire accurately. This allowed the smaller British ships, like jackals, to close in and start firing their eight-inch guns. At 9.02, disaster befell Bismarck. One of Rodney's massive 16-inch shells smashed into the ship. Survivors suggest it might even have hit the bridge itself. Hundreds were killed, including probably Lindemann and Lutchins. Bismarck's command and control had been shot away. It was now only a matter of time. We closed the range and we came in from 27,000 yards, finally to about um, 4,000 yards, um, and were pumping stuff into her pretty hard. And she kept up a desultory fire for a long time, a very, very brave action. Um, because although we failed to sink her, we certainly we, we knocked her about and she was um, on fire in many places, a lot of smoke. And you could see the shells crumping against her side. So what you've got now is, is a really brutal one-sided battle. And the, the British don't have any choice. They can't, there's no room for sentimentality in this. This ship needs to be sunk. And unless the Germans strike their colours and surrender, which they're not going to do, th there's no option but just to keep pummeling and pummeling at close range. These 14-inch shells and 16-inch shells, plus lighter shells were joining in even from the cruisers, 18-inch shells, were starting to pound the Bismarck into submission. Despite colossal damage to the ship and to her chain of command, Bismarck fought on, a wounded animal in its death throes. 0927, Bismarck fired her final salvo before more British shells smashed into the ship. By 0931, all four main turrets were out of action. The fight was all but over. Tovey had ordered that there was to be no let up until the Germans struck their ensign, basically took down their battle flag as a sign of surrender. The problem was that eyewitnesses remember that by this stage, the, the deck of Bismarck was a smoking, ruined hellscape. There were no flag halyards to be raised and lowered by that point anyway. The battering continued non-stop. Aboard Rodney, the chaplain took the extraordinary step of confronting the captain directly to plead with him to stop the attack. He was ordered politely to mind his own business and the shells kept flying. It was a rather a bloody business. One had to go on to sink the ship. But there were people occasionally, that I saw a few of them, running aft and jumping over the side while we were still engaging her. So you just imagine this ship being relentlessly hit by 16-inch and 14-inch armour-piercing shells, and then by torpedo strikes, she's on fire, she's listing. The conditions on board were absolutely frightful. We, we know that from, from eyewitnesses who survived the sinking. Now, the evidence seems to be that, that the crew ultimately scuttled their own ship. Um, there is a tradition of this in the German Navy that really probably begins with the, the high seas fleet at the end of the First World War. It's seen as a, a more honourable way of you know, ending the battle if you've, you've scuttled your own ship rather than let the enemy do it. Um, it's academic, and I can't emphasise this enough. Bismarck is going down. Bismarck will be sunk. This was a fight to the death, and it was not just a matter of revenge for the hood, although that was probably an element of it. What essentially this was, was about ending that threat to Britain's Atlantic sea lanes. At 10.20, the demolition charges were blown at around the same time as HMS Dorsetshire was told to close in and sink Bismarck with her torpedoes. 20 minutes later, at 
the firing finally stopped. And Bismarck, the pride of Adolf Hitler's navy, sank beneath the waves of the Atlantic. Bismarck had a crew of 2,200 men. Only 114 survived the awful ordeal. Shortly after Bismarck sank, the message was relayed back to the Admiralty. Admiral Tovey later said, the Bismarck had put up a most gallant fight against impossible odds, worthy of the old days of the Imperial German Navy. And she went down with her colours flying. Bismarck's final hours are a tribute to the bravery of her crew and the quality of her design and her construction. The British had ranged everything from battleships all the way down to destroyers in the final action, and there were even bombers on standby to finish the job if necessary. Uh, Bismarck took a very impressive amount of killing, but it is worth noting that although she took hours to defeat and sink, the unsinkability which was prized so much in her design could not guarantee the maintenance of her fighting power, and it's noteworthy that very quickly into her final engagement, Bismarck's fighting power is progressively broken so rapidly that in contrast to her victory on the 24th of May, this mighty warship did not manage to land one single significant hit on any of her tormentors before the end came. People say that the Royal Navy were lucky to get away with the Bismarck action. I really don't think that's fair at all. I think, I think there is luck in any action. They say no plan survives contact with the enemy. The minute that the shells start to fly, um, and things start to break down, as things start to, to malfunction, you need luck. The Germans get some luck. You can argue that they're lucky to destroy Hood. Um, they're kind of lucky to break radar contact. The British get that luck with the torpedo strike in the end. You cannot take luck out of the equation in any battle. Bismarck's first and only operation had lasted just nine days. But it was nine days of the highest drama for both sides. And an action that would cast a long shadow. The whole Bismarck campaign was a bit of a watershed, both for the Kriegsmarine and the Royal Navy. For the Germans, it essentially stopped any more idea of sending large capital ships out into the Atlantic. From that point on, that could only be done with U-boats. The other instruction that, that comes from the top in Germany is that um, German warships, surface warships, um, when they're mostly operating in the Arctic, are not allowed to engage a British force that has an aircraft carrier with it. And there is a constant question about, you know, any time they contemplate sending out Tirpitz or Scharnhorst to raid the Arctic convoy routes, the first question is, where are the aircraft carriers? There is aircraft carrier fright within the German Navy from this point. For the British, it meant that they no longer had to keep so many units defending its, its convoy routes. Some of those vitally needed capital ships and aircraft carriers could be sent where they could make a big difference in the Mediterranean or even round to the Far East. The British are very, very aware of how close the Germans came to pulling this off. If it really, if it wasn't for the, the Catalina that finds her in the middle of the Atlantic and then the, the swordfish that puts a torpedo into her steering gear, Bismarck could have got home. And so what, what the British learning from this whole business is that actually they deployed almost the entire Royal Navy, countless capital ships, cruisers, destroyers, two aircraft carriers, and this one German raider still nearly made it home after sinking a British capital ship. So that then imposes real problems for the British when Tirpitz, Bismarck's identical sister, appears. Now, Tirpitz does almost nothing in the Second World War. She, she does very, very little. She sits in Norway, the lonely Queen of the North. But the Royal Navy remain obsessed with her and maintain an incredibly strong home fleet at Scapa Flow in the Orkneys, basically because of Tirpitz, because they have the fear that if Tirpitz breaks out, they will have to do this all over again, and they might not get as lucky the next time. The hunting and sinking of Bismarck was also a key stage in the shifting nature of naval warfare. The final battle 
was almost something straight out of Jutland. And that was one of the last flings of the battleship. The first half of the Second World War is characterised by a realisation that battleships are not the capital ship anymore and they are vulnerable and they are vulnerable to carrier-based aviation. Um, we, it's a lesson that, that was, was learnt at Taranto, it was then learnt in the Bismarck action, it's learnt again at Pearl Harbour and with the loss of the Prince of Wales and repulse to Japanese aircraft. Battleships have had their day. What they are now is, is big floating gun platforms that have to be surrounded and protected by other ships and by aeroplanes. But Bismarck had been sunk. Britain had successfully seen off the greatest naval challenge it had faced thus far in the Second World War. Britain's supply lines across the Atlantic remained intact. The price had been high, Hood lost, and Bismarck had showed up shortcomings in British naval doctrine and equipment. But even though it was closer than she might have liked, Britannia still ruled the waves. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.